Hi, and welcome to another edition of CG Programming for Game Development. My name is Nate Nessler, and again, we're here with Hyperactive Studios. So, what I have before me here is uh, some of the release notes of the CG uh, programming language. And they're now at version 3.0, like I said before. And one of the nice things here about the release notes, and there are six different documents here that comes with it, um, but has a list of all the supported profiles for the new 3.0. Now, does this mean all of them are going to work with NVIDIA FX Compo uh, Composer 2.5? The answer, of course, is no. And the reason why is because this is older. It's not up to date with the new uh, CG 3.0. And guy, give him a break. <laughs> they only released this about, I don't know, a few days ago or a week ago. So this is a hot off the press type thing uh, when I saw it. But, um,. This is really nice because it does give you a nice layout of all the profiles here. So if at any point in time you want to go look at a particular profile or whatever, simply just pop over there, download the CG uh, programming kit toolkit, and you're going to want that anyways uh, for doing your programming later on uh, when we go in to do uh, some of this coding for doing the C++ with it. Now, they do have extra documents with it, which are quite nice. Uh, for instance, there's the reference manual, and it is like it says. It's a reference manual. It is not something I would say that you would learn with, but it does make for a wonderful reference if you already know and understand this stuff. Um, as you can see, it's just the same format, and it goes on for 1,137 pages of this. But it's quite nice, and if you do need to look up something in a quick... Uh, you know, at any point in time, and you've already got a handle on this and everything, then it's very nice for that, and it, you don't have to go and hunt through and dig through a whole bunch of extra uh, stuff you already know, you know. There's no point in doing that when you already know all the stuff, but if you don't know all the stuff, then I'm afraid this isn't going to be all that useful. But it is uh, great for those who already are familiar with it. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the other documents they can send with this, which is quite nice. I'm just showing you this so that you have um, be aware of some more um, type of resources that are at your disposal. Now this right here is the language specification and in this you'll see additional um, listings of information in here which is also quite nice. This only goes on for uh, 24 pages which isn't bad at all and has a little bit just uh, basically a basic overall um, Eh, once over of some of the information here and just briefly describes it. Um, there's no uh, by example, so to speak, but it certainly does uh, do a nice job of going through here and explaining uh, just some basic stuff here. Now, um, <laughs> something I need to point out, um, I did forget to mention that uh, there's a sampler of 1D for doing um, well, if you think about it like a gradient, but it'd be literally one pixel wide, so it'd just be something like this. And the reason why you want something like that is, say you want this pixel to vary over time or something like that, you can simply sample it across the uh, texture coordinate for doing that, or you can sit there and repeat it inside of a texture, inside of a shader, across the surface, and create something like this here, without needing all the rest of the pixels from the image, thus saving you a tremendous amount of time and memory, and then you just sit there, simply just use this to draw out the... Uh, the fragment shader. So, I mean, if you wanted to produce an image like this, you literally wouldn't need all these other pixels that are involved here. You'd only need one row of pixels all the way across the top here, or something like that, and literally only have the image to be one pixel wide, uh, well, tall, shall I say, and then this many pixels wide. So that certainly saves a lot of memory on the card, and there's a whole lot of other stuff you can use it for besides this, of course. Um, you could use it to control the uh, glow over time on, a, say, a glowing dial or something like that to cause a a non-uniform linear um, you know, distribution of that movement. You could also do it through an algorithm. I mean, there's just a lot of ways to do this stuff. I mean, that is generated with an algorithm, so, you know. But, you know, this allows an artist to go in and hand paint something if they want and allows to control it that way. Um, so it allows some extra flexibility uh, that an artist can make use of that you couldn't do with an algorithm. So, and, you know, you always have to be, uh, you always have to think of what the artists, you know, may want to do or make use of because they're going to work in a different workflow in a different manner than the way you're going to work. So be aware of that and always think of them too. So you want to have to tackle uh, problems from multiple angles uh, from maybe a mathematics standpoint and in other times you want to attack it from an artistic standpoint so that the artist can uh, 
you know, contribute as much as they can from their end um, to the look and feel of it because they'll outdo you any day <laughs> when it comes to heart, uh, that's for sure. Okay, and there isn't a sampler of 40, I was thinking of a sampler of 40 for the volumetric, no, it's sampler 3D for the volumetric. Uh, sampler cube and rect, rect is for non-power uh, of 2 type uh, non-DDS uh, file formats. Uh, sampler cube here is for cube maps. Um, these are like sky boxes and things of that nature. We'll get into that later on when we do an example of that. And then you just have a regular, um, yeah, sampler. Um, but we have some other types of information in here that's quite interesting. Uh, let's see here. Now they mentioned double, and that's cool. But double is certainly not supported by the NVIDIA, as I showed earlier. If I type in double, it's not supported. Now, it says it's supported here, so maybe it is in 3.0 or whatever, I don't know. But um, it's certainly not supported in the uh, NVIDIA FX 2.5. Um, and I was right about this. The floating point, I did do a checkup on it. This is 32-bit, just like I said, and this half is 16-bit. And turns out the fix is a 12-bit. So I want to point that out. It says there's longs and shorts here, too, but again, they're also not compatible with NVIDIA FX Composer 2.5. If I type in long, no good. Short, no good. So be aware of that. Only the data types I showed earlier are compatible uh, with FX Composer. Okay, so with that, um, but this language spec can be useful. You can use this to quickly look up different things. Um, it showed a good layout of uh, some of the ways things are done in here, including uh, a nice layout of some of the array units here, like for instance this. It's a nice layout of assigning an array, gra um, typing it up like this and assigning it here directly. Um, there's some other things too. Let's see here. You wouldn't want to do a whole bunch of values like this if you could avoid it for initialization. Uh, you're better off if you have, uh, if you know the value ahead of time to put that in directly because it's going to be an optimization if you do that. If it has to go through a variable to get the value then it's going to be slower than it is for you to directly put in the value. I know that's not as um, pretty like you would want normally in programming C do a constant and then apply that constant uh, to the initialization of the variable so you can simply just change that constant. It makes it clean and easy and makes it uh, where you understand it. My suggestion is to put comments after you put a physical number like that because if you're doing the constant though you're going to be imposing a uh, slowdown in your program for your um, your shader effect here so when it gets converted to the assembly. So by all means uh, make sure that you be aware of that. Okay. Um, I think there was one other thing that was interesting here. They had a nice demo uh, of uh, the shader pipeline for CG, and it's not in this document. It's early on in one of the documents. I'm trying to remember which one it is that I liked. I just saw it and liked it uh, immediately. It might be the user manual. Oh, yes, it is the user manual. Great. So, yeah, I like this one. This uh, CG language manual here is 356 pages. Um, this is more easier to read than some of the other ones, but um, we're taking this in baby steps to make it easier to learn this stuff. And they kind of just throw you right into the mix of things directly right away in here. So if you thought any of this stuff was getting complex or whatever, uh, this is going to be a lot rougher as far as this goes here. Uh, as you can see, there's not really much precursor to it, and then bam, you're right in the midst of it uh, right away. And <laughs> there's no build up to this. It's just, you know. Um, they just jump right into it. So uh, that's great if you're already very familiar with Shadar programming uh, from other languages or previously, then you could easily do that and it wouldn't be an issue. But if you're not, then this is going to be a little difficult if you're learning Shader programming for the first time. Maybe uh, quite a bit difficult uh, for some people, I would say. Uh, probably more uh, than not, um, probably a lot more people would have trouble with this than I would say a few. Um, by far. Um, but still, uh, it's not bad. It's well written. Um, and this is there for you um, as you're going through this stuff. Now, it does have a nice listing of some of these functions, and you can always refer back to this too uh, for um, when you're trying to remember some of the functions and what's possible and capable for doing this. Something I want to point out now, as you can see, some of these mathematical functions. Um, 
like for instance sine cos. Um, the reason why you would use a function like sine cos instead of just writing cosine and then doing one for sine separately because it's an optimization directly on the 3D card where you can do the sine and cosine computed com simultaneously together um, by making better use of memory and the computational um, aspects of the actual 3D card. So uh, whenever you can, use sine cos when you need to do sine and cosine calculations instead of calculating sine and cosine separately because that's another optimization technique that you can do in order to speed up the calculations here. And again, anytime you can speed up calculations, the better off you are. Okay, so some of this other stuff gets into cross product as you learn from the matrix um, mathematics. Um, there's also... Um, <laughs> a lot of other things here. We have a dot product here, we have a determinant, um, floor, f mod, all these kinds of mathematics things, uh, absolute value, uh, a cosine, and some of the stuff, we'll, we'll mess with this as we're going through it, we're going to play around with the math and see what kind of effects you get from using different mathematical formulas in different ways, and ways of visualizing the mathematics in order to determine what kind of visual effect that's going to have on your shader or on your modeling or tessellation or whatever it is that you're doing. So that's something important to understand here um, in that these mathematical functions create different visual effects depending on the way they graph and you can take uh, you can make use of that in order to create and generate procedurally um, entire effects and looks to things. We're going to start playing around with that some here. Um, right now I have an inflate set up for you guys. Uh, we're going to go over how to do an inflate. Oh, this noise by the way is great. Um, you might think I'd like to do a random number. Okay, great. Uh, but the problem with random number is it's going to be completely random every single uh, frame. So if you're doing 60 frames a second, you're going to have something jump all over the place like static, if you will. Um, it's the best way I, c I can think of explaining it, where you have one value way up here and then suddenly it's way down there and then the next frame is way up there. And so it just looks like usually it looks very bad. Um, it's great if you're using this for a mission type plane, for doing a, a determining where you're going to be emitting points on a um, particle effect because it really keeps it random on the emission aspects to where it doesn't look like there's any real pattern to it which is great that's what you want but for most things that is not what you want say you want to do a rough terrain well it's going to look like a whole bunch of pins and needles basically if you use a random now if you do a noise on the other hand which is like think of it random with interpolation right so going from point A to point B over this distance here, you're going to get some kind of uh, variation fall off acro across them instead of just total p uh, peaks and valleys, you know what I mean? Meaning a high point and a low point and up to another high point down to another low point like that, you know what I mean? There's just like totally just like pins and needles, just like I said. It's really spiky. It's totally, you don't, I mean you couldn't sit there and have a vehicle drive over, you know, a spiky terrain where it's just nothing but you know, spikes throughout the whole thing that just wouldn't even be possible to do it. You do want a terrain that has, um, you know, that gradually builds up and falls and, you know, goes up and down and deforms appropriately uh, and not have these massive variations in the actual uh, terrain. And noise is going to give you that. So, noise is great. Noise is used all the time. It's wonderful. It's also great for animation. You could use it to create uh, camera shakes. You can do it for, um, Oh, the bumping of uh, the tires on a rig for a vehicle a simulation. So say you want to simulate like the like the vehicle is taking bumps and stuff from the road, you can do that. Uh, use the little noise, set the parameter for the amplification of the uh, value there for your multiplier, and bam, there you go. You can determine how much those tires basically bounce. So you could sit there and literally increase the bouncingness of the tires as it's going over rougher terrain versus lower terrain. You could redo that value in from the surface as it's driving over it from, let's say, a shader or something of that nature or through an anisotropic friction value or something of that nature. Um, that's great, you know. You can have it based on some kind of collision. I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> you can do it. Okay, you can do it on some kind of based on some kind of collision where you get a property from the surface that you're colliding with in order to determine whether or not uh, that could be a driver, more or less, uh, procedurally to drive the value of the bumpiness of the tires. All right, so there it is. Uh, you could do something of that nature. I'm not going to get into how to do that. I'm going to cover how to do that kind of stuff in the Blender uh, game programming series. So if you're interested, you can check that out. Um, but it'll, yeah, that's um, outside of the scope of what we're talking about here. Um, it's got power uh, radians. Radians are very important. Degree to radian conversion. Um, 
a lot of your mathematics when you calculate them are in radians so then if you can just sit there and do all your calculations directly in radians then you save yourself from having to do a bunch of conversions back and forth between degrees and radians over and over again uh, that's why it's so important to have things in radians because when you do a mathematical calculation it's going to come out in radians so the more times you have to convert back and forth the more times you slow down your you know simulation and you affect the game uh, frame rate so that certainly is a problem so be aware of that um, saturation sine cosine uh, sine sine cosine I was talking about this one right here this is the combo deal I was talking about you apply an angle in here and then you put what you want to be as your output for your sine and which one for your cosine okay so whatever variables you pass in here this is going to be assigned a value and this is going to be assigned a value this is going to be assigned the sine uh, angle calculation and then this is going to be assigned the cosine uh, value and this is based on uh, sine length and cosine length and this would be some angle here okay um, hyperbolic sine of x um, smooth step is nice we'll get into that that's really great uh, step is going to be more of a, a harder um, variation between them it creates a certain look to a graph which is really nice and very useful for certain things um, square root, tan, tan h, etc. Transpose, that gets into matrices, uh, where you transpose a matrix. It can be useful for certain things. Uh, distance face forward, uh, this has to do typically if, uh, say, a face is facing towards the camera. For instance, length, uh, that one's useful. This lets you find the length. This can be used for all kinds of things, including doing like voxels or something like that to determine uh, spherical collisions or anything of that nature for distance formulas, etc. Um, that can be useful. Normalize. This lets you get just the direction of a vector and not the magnitude. It lets you ditch the magnitude. Now we're going to actually use this one right here. So no kidding, it's very useful. This lets you do a reflect and this lets you do a refract, which is awesome. Um, and then there's all kinds of other stuff here but for right now let's just focus on some of the math and we'll spend a little bit of time playing around with some of this stuff and we'll continue on uh, going through some of these different things here okay so with that we have another set of formulas here so I broke things down a little bit different and added in the inter uh, LERP for um, you know linear interpolation and I broke the formula down further into uh, different values here to be applied. And first I just did this inverse color here of this uh, grayscale image just like from last time. And then I did as a combined color where I have it where it's going like just like this basically. And I'm multiplying a different color times each one. So I got the diffuse channel going uh, times one of these and the diffuse channel is being done by the regular one just like this regular gray. And the inverse of this is being done by the gradient color and I'm just literally adding those together for the combined color of the two and then I'm doing a linear interpolation of the combined color with the actual main um, texture color here and then I'm blending it based on this value so if I come down here I can simply just blend between the two and there you can see both colors being applied to this uh, setup here and then here's the original colors here but if I come back down this way I can get a half blend on it and that's nice and again I can always just come in here and play around with my colors just as before but you guys have seen all this stuff before now and so this is starting to become old hat as far as how this works which is great I mean it needs to be because as you do this stuff more and more you know the more and more you learn the better off you are of course okay so I'll say something like that all right great and that's cool and you've seen all this before and we can assign our textures and all this good stuff but something you haven't seen is this. I added in a new inflate value uh, here and now I am <laughs> distorting <laughs> the plane in weird and strange ways. Now you're probably going, why, why isn't the windshield going with it? Well, because the windshield doesn't have this assigned to it as a shader. But if I did assign this as a shader to it, then it would be doing this. Um, I'm going to set it back to 1 because, again, if you do 1 multiply times whatever, you get the normal thing. So basically no inflation means if you multiply it times 1 you get no inflation. Okay. Unfortunately we can't do that with the economy. Alright, so um, if I come down here um, and one of the things I had to add was this inflate uh, pr parameter here. Uh, variable, if you will. So I did. I did a const float inflate 
And that's all I needed. And then I did an annotation here. And of course, I'm going to assign it to 1.0F. Now, something I did here, of course, I named it, uh, I did a type slider here, and then I named it inflate. So it's going to come up as inflate. Uh, but for my UI min, I'm doing a negative 100. Now, I could have set this to 50, really, or something of that nature, because at a certain point in time here, it actually goes and starts inverting through itself. See that? It starts crossing through itself down here. And about around 50, we're still doing good because it hasn't interpenetrated. But right around there it does. So really, honestly, it should probably be 50 <laughs> for the minimum. Uh, you can always just do, you know play around with the stuff and, and get things of that nature. Okay, so I'll be nice and I'll just do a 50 right here. Uh, save all, rebuild file, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now I can only get 50 here for my range for the lower end and then that for my upper end. Awesome. It does make it a little easier to control, too. Uh, to make it easier to control, I did make the uh, UI step 1.0F. And that's because the range here is so large. And I did have to set the range really large in order to get an effect here on the inflate. I did a UI max step here of 100. And, of course, you could set this a lot higher if you want to go to 1,000 if you like. Um, and that's fine and dandy, but I think we get enough of an effect on this uh, plane here. Now, if you, I had to resize this plane. Now, if your plane is really giant, ginormous, which this one was when we first imported it, and you didn't scale it down, then you may need to set this value up higher or to scale down the plane, one of the two. Something's got to give, basically. So you'll have to find out what values work best for you. Uh, it may not be quite the same as mine. Uh, one oh, however, is going to be you know, the original size of the plane without inflation. I did do some other things, too. I switched out the texture here for my main one, and I switched out my texture for the second one, so it just automatically loaded this upon loading up the program in the future and not based on anything that was pre-clicked uh, or set with the, uh, from the artist panel. So now it is defaulting to these textures, which is better, really. Uh, all this just stays the same here. None of that code is required to be changed around. Um, my vertex shader and all aspects of that haven't changed at all. Uh, for the most part, let's see here. No, I'm a lie. Um, this is the one that's changed. I'm sorry. The pixel shader is the one that hasn't changed. Okay, so the vertex shader, I was like, wait a minute, no, it's, it's the form. Of course, it's got to be the vertex shader. Okay, so yes, because the vertices are being manipulated, so it's going to be the vertex shader. So, something we had to add. Well, let's have a look at that real quick. If I look at my struct, do I have to do anything to it? Because I'm having a hard time remembering at this point. No, I sure didn't. Okay, cool. So nothing there for the struct. All right. So when I have this over here, we have our I created a position variable. Now this kind of gets crazy because we now have three position variables. We have the one that's coming in, we have the one that's part of the struct, and then we have the one that's created with inside of this function. Thankfully. I'm only using this temporarily. So if I do inflate times normalize and then I pass in the position here. So what am I doing? I'm normalizing the position of this removes the magnitude of the position or the length of the vector and it only just gives me the and sets it between 0 and 1 for the um, overall magnitude of the vector. It's essentially just like I said eliminates the magnitude of the vector and we only get direction at that point. I'm then basically adding uh, the magnitude of the vector to this vector by multiplying it times inflate. Now at this point in time, inflate is a multiplier that is basically allowing me to dynamically change the magnitude of this position vector on the fly. And that's great. Now we can actually literally control the magnitude of the position vectors here at this point in time. And that's how we are actually doing this inflate process. After that, it's a simple uh, deal where we just take the actual position of the points and then we add to it basically the magnitude multiplied of the position to here, to our actual original position. And that's quite literally how we are inflating this. That's it. And essentially what this is doing is spherizing the surface as because as the more and more this um, becomes inflated, the more and more it's going to try to move itself into the shape of a sphere, more or less. And that's essentially what's going on here. And that's all there is to it. It's really honestly that simple. And again, the way this is working is we're giving it a magnitude by multiplying it. Remember here, we're removing the magnitude of the actual position here. So it's not, um, it doesn't have any magnitude for the vector. And then here we're multiplying some number to give it whatever magnitude we want. And then we're adding that magnitude back to the original position in order to affect it. 
you might be going, well, why not just add the inflate directly? Well, because it's not going to do it per. Um, okay, so let's say let's have we have a vector like this. Okay, so say we have a vector that's like I don't know, 0 0.3, um, 0 0.5, and another one is like 0 0.75, something like that, right? X, Y, Z are like this now, and this is our normalized vector, right? Well, if I'm multiplying, say, oh boy, I should have done this. I'll do something smart, 10. Or let's say we're doing 100 times this, right? So I'm going to end up with 30, 50, and 75, right, for my values. And then this way, I could uh, apply that back. Now, if you just say, well, why not just add inflate to it instead, then I would have been adding 100 for x, 100 for for y and 100 for z. And obviously, they're not in the same, uh, they have different uh, links here for, in order to create the direction of the vector. So therefore, if I were to do that, of course, I'm going to get the wrong result. So in order to uh, create the correct result here, um, getting rid of the magnitude of these you know, values, maybe the original vector looks something like, you know, something like this right here. Yeah. Maybe it looked like that, right? So by me normalizing it, I take away the magnitude of this vector, bring it down to a 0 to 1 uh, span here for the magnitude, and then I'm multiplying it times the value I want it to be for the actual magnitude, uh, that I'm controllable magnitude. And then that gets added to the original position. So 30 would get added to, uh, if I were to add this out, right, it would be uh, 30 plus 3 here, which would give me 33 for x. Let me just line this up. Okay. And then uh, I would be adding 50 to 5, and so I'd end up with 55. And then I'd be adding uh, 7.5, uh, 75 to 7.5, right? So it's going to give me um, that'd be 82.5, like that. And so that's your final result. And then that's why it's getting, you know, um, inflated. And that's how that works mathematically. Um, hopefully that makes some sense. Again, remember this is the original vector here. This original vector. This is after it gets normalized. This is after the inflate uh, variable is multiplied times it, and because it acts as a scalar, right? So it's getting a uh, hundred multiplied times 0 0.3 is going to give me 30. You know, times 0.5 is going to give me 50, and then times 75 is going to—I mean, 0.75 is going to give me 75, right? And then at this stage, or here, I'll just well, one second. Let me t break this down a little better. All right, this is this position value here. Okay. And then we normalized it. And that gives me this here. And then I multiplied the inflate scalar times my uh, vector normalized and I got this here. And then I added it to my original position like so which gave me this here and then of course then we append a point one here for W which is going to be like that. So, and then that gets mul uh, multiplied times the model view projection matrix, and then that's what gets outputted to uh, be shaded and displayed on the screen. So that's how all that works. All right, very cool. And that's basically inflate. And so you can see how we can use very simple mathematics in order to create crazy cool uh, effects and powerful uh, capabilities here because now this can be animated over time you could sit there and uh, make something inflate inside of a game uh, maybe I don't know maybe the door starts swelling or something like that from the water pushing against it or maybe a balloon is getting blown up and then needs to pop or something like that or just blown up period you just need to blow a balloon up ta-da here it is that's how you pull off that effect it's just some basic mathematics here for uh, manipulating some vectors and bam you got it you know before it gets multiplied times a matrix and you know stuff's probably all new to you and a little bit maybe in a little bit scary if you're an experienced uh, shader programmer then none of this is new to you probably but um, if you're not this is going to be just about getting used to using mathematics in order to create crazy cool uh, effects and capabilities that you can do with it including not just graphically but also for manipulating the actual um, vertices. Now with the tessellation shader you're actually adding polygons where you're telling it so you could do all kinds of crazy things with the mathematics for that too. And it's great including distance from the camera and just I mean just 
man, there's so many great things you can do with these new capabilities. And now if they create geometry shader capabilities, um, right now we're only looking at vertex and fragment, but there's two others. There's also geometry creation and there's also tessellation. And that's going to be part of the 3.0 CG language, which is not available in um, our FX Composer 2.5. But we'll do what we can with uh, what we're playing with. Now, as a certain point to, to make here, I am using um, uh, XP 64-bit right now. And my reasoning for doing this was because when I tried to do the um, formula, and hopefully this doesn't happen to you, but when I was trying to do the formula like sine cos or any of the other formulas that had to do with these mathematical functions, it didn't work. It was not recognized by FX Composer 2.5 um, in the Windows 732-bit on this computer uh, when I tried it. So, but now that I moved over to XP 32-bit, I mean 64-bit here, um, I tried it out and it worked. It worked fine. So, um, I don't know what to say. Uh, things that wouldn't compile and work due to, um, I guess, some incompatibilities with the the new uh, Windows 7. Again, this program was compiled and created before Windows 7 ever came out, and so this is nothing to do with NVIDIA. This is just, again, an incompatibility with the particular software here with Windows 7. Uh, hopefully, uh, one day here, they'll uh, release another version. They just released, you know, CG 3.0, so I think it's likely in the future here they'll release a, a, an update to Composer here uh, from NVIDIA, but uh, I mean, they haven't had any time to work on it. They just finished releasing, you know, uh, CG 3.0, which is awesome that they did that because that's the most important thing is to receive that first before we receive a nice, cool graphical tool for working with this stuff. First and foremost, get the actual language updated, and they have. And you know, OpenGL has gone through so many um, different. Uh, every six months, it's been getting updated with a major release of the um, shader, <laughs> with the whole sh um, graphical programming shader languages. So it's extremely hard to keep up with. Uh, it is constantly have new features coming out for it. It's amazing. It's absolutely awesome. And every time they release uh, really hard-hitting, awesome features that we, everyone needs, and it's really great. Um, it's But, you know, from a... They can't even put out courses fast enough or information on it uh, for the keep up with the pace at which it's being developed right now. So it's amazing that NVIDIA is keeping pace with them pretty much here and just kicking out CG uh, up to date with what they've done here with OpenGL and the whole shading language here with GLSL. And it's wonderful. And then now it works with uh, both the new DirectX 11 and your OpenGL 4.1 that's currently out here. So great. That's uh, awesome and very useful. And again, we didn't have to do anything with our technique or past zero. Um, these are the tech, uh, the different profiles that I know work inside of um, FX Composer 2.5. Now you can try in these other profiles that are from the release notes here, but I have no idea which ones are going to work and which ones aren't. Um, if you look at like I can only do DirectX 9 here, so you know that's probably the uh, extent at which the height I can go here with the profiles. So I wouldn't expect a profile um, newer than that to work on this one. If you happen to have DirectX 10 pop up here, then you would be able to do DirectX 10. But I'm currently uh, with OpenGL um, here and DirectX um, 9, and I don't know to what extent the OpenGL is supported, but I suspect it's just uh, VP40 or something like that. Let's see here, release notes, yeah, release notes. So, you know, um, yeah, it's just we're going to be to a certain point. So, yeah, I'm constrained to this here for, for what it looks appears to be the setup here, whereas this is uh, the one for OpenGL here that I can make use of. Okay. And again, I can switch back and forth to these. Now, I have not done any profiles for DirectX. If I had, it would display and show up, but I haven't, so it's not, so that's why. I did uh, downgrade this from 40 to 30 just to show that it does work. Now, when I went down to 20, I started going beyond the capabilities of that profile of that card, and I'll just show you that real quick. 
and bam. Yeah, so you see, again, remember what I said, when the hardware couldn't support a feature or something like that, it's going to turn white uh, for the hardware. And that's exactly what's happened here. Now, if I go back here to FP30 and BP30 here for the profile, uh, I just want to show this real quick. Bam, it comes back and works fine. And the reason that's happening is because uh, it's not being supported uh, in the older format here. So, um, very cool and very nice indeed. And of course, 40 is supported. Now, if you can get an older one to work, all the newer ones will work too. So, the the key here is to see how far back you can go with a particular technique before you run into the white, <laughs> more or less, until things just completely die on you, or you get red uh, outline here, or a white feedback from error that uh, the hardware could not be uh, computed on this or whatnot. So, um, I. You know, just, I'm still having some issues with the program, uh, having some uh, crashing problems with textures being sel uh, selected and loaded, or whatnot. And I suspect it has to do with the fact that I'm running 64-bit XP instead of 32-bit XP would be my guess. And maybe the program isn't really—I uh, don't think this is a 64-bit program. I think it's a 32-bit program. So I could be running into some problems and some issues from that. Um, but yeah, uh, a lot of programs are not set up for the, the newer stuff. Most of the ones are using uh, Visual Studio 2005 and 2008 right now, and most of the libraries for the program have not gone to the uh, Visual Studio 2010. So, and I mean the libraries just now being released are, are still are compatible only with 2005 and 2008. I don't know when we're going to see um, full compatibility with some of the libraries for uh, Windows 7 and for um, Visual Studio 2010, um, you know, it, they changed the, the way some of the things work. It's a little more difficult now in order to, in 2010 to add in uh, some of the libraries you're going to use on a regular basis um, like you could in 2008 uh, version of Visual Studio. I'll go over how to do both uh, later on when we get to that step, but for now, uh, that's just a little heads up there. Okay, so uh, in the next videos we'll be going over uh, some more mathematical functions um, for causing different effects um, in addition to doing some other ones for lighting uh, and start going over the different light models so we can move beyond uh, PS1 graphics more or less and what could be done back when into more like um, some of the fancier uh, techniques you can do for shading and capabilities of the newer cards so that way you're not sitting back here with older look to things. You can, that way we have a nicer and newer look to it. And we'll get into lighting and how to create your own lighting functions and how to um, make use of that on different ones. I just kind of like showing off some of this mathematics early on here to kind of wet your palate and so you can get excited about what you can do with some of the math. Alright, so with that, um, this has been CG Game Development. My name is Nate Nessler and this is from Hyperactive Studios. Thank you very much.